Thank you for joining me for another episode of the Your Longevity Blueprint podcast. Today I'm joined by Dr. Kira Barr, who believes that going through menopause shouldn't mean you have to push pause on feeling comfortable and confident in your skin. As a dual board certified dermatologist, global speaker, and best selling author, she founded the Resilient Health Institute and created the Skinny Dipping Method to help mid- midlife women strip away fatigue, stress, and shame surrounding menopause and uncover the secrets to making midlife the best time of their life. As a former assistant clinical professor at UC Davis in the departments of dermatology and pathology, advisor to numerous startups, author and editorial reviewer of multiple leading medical journals, Dr. Barr passionately bridges the gap between the latest evidence-based research and an integrative approach to health. She turns conventional methodologies on their heads, blending science with soul to bring an innovative and compassionate approach to women's health and skin care. Her book, The Skin Whisperer, blends her medical expertise with cognitive science and her own health journey, creating a framework to support readers on a journey towards self-discovery, self-love, and create resilient health. Dr. Barr's expertise has been featured on national TV, radio podcasts, as well as popular outlets, including Mind Body Green, Insider, Reader's Digest, Glamour Self, and Oprah Magazine. So that was a lot. That was a wonderful bio. <laughs> Welcome to the show, Dr. Barr. <laughs> well, I know, it's a, it's a mouthful. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> lots, of, lots of credibility there. So tell us your I story. I'm old. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> I've been at this for a while. <laughs> well, you don't look old. You look great. So tell, us, tell us your story, how you uh, got into the, the philosophy that you use with your patients with their skin and how, um, uh, before the show, we were talking about kind of spoiler alert, we both have had skin cancer. And so I'd like you to share your journey and your yeah, how you you approach your patients. Yeah, so my journey starts actually when I was a, young, a kid um, and I was made fun of for what was on my skin. And mm-hmm. I never put all the pieces together why I ultimately went into dermatology, but I'm sure that had something to do with it for feeling uncomfortable in the skin that I was in and trying to mask that shame with suntans and sunburns. And even though I am a brunette, my dad is a redhead and I have his fair skin. So I was never meant to spend a ton of time outside. Uh, Fast forward to um, adulthood. I am full on dermatology now. I'm wearing my sunscreen. I'm wearing the protective clothing. Um, But the damage had already been done from frying myself uh, over the years. I had hundreds of moles. Many of them had been changing over the, the decades. And, you know, in derm, you're like, oh, it's changing. You just cut it out forget about it. I just thought that was kind of how it was meant to be in some ways. You just, that's just the party line where we're talking traditional training. And, um, and then there was that one spot on my arm that definitely was different from the others. And unfortunately, um, being a skin cancer melanoma, um, expert like it, that was the focus of my practice and being derm path at the time where I get to look at the skin underneath the microscope, having the extreme horror of seeing <laughs> the atypical self myself and knowing that it was bad news. Um, so thankfully, because I knew what to look for and that's why I'm so passionate about teaching other people how to check their skin so they can uh, catch things very early. Uh, that was kind of the beginning of a health crisis for me. And I think many of us that are in this more um, holistic approach to well-being, it's because our own health takes a hit, a big mm-hmm. hit. And um, so it was skin cancer. And then it was um, my hormones just going completely out of whack. So I was running ultra marathons at that time thinking I'm doing all the right things, uh, being healthy, exercising, eating what I thought was uh, good for me. Uh, and none of it was right for me. And um, unfortunately, a um, couple surgeries later, a couple years of trying to claw my way out of um, some bad situations, I discovered more of the functional integrative approach because what I was traditionally taught wasn't solving my issue. And so I figured if as a physician, I struggled. How are the other people who don't have the resources mm-hmm. to evaluate the literature and things um, be able to sort it out? So I know that's kind of long-winded, but that is how I wound up doing the work that I do so that I could help other women, especially especially in midlife, um, when our hormones are shifting and there's so much conflicting information about what's safe, what's not safe. 
um, to really be able to help them so that they don't have to suffer because pain is, you know, we, we struggle, so it, it's inevitable, but suffering is completely optional. I don't want to have to suffer. Well, I, I like that suffering is optional, but we do have to make some changes, right, with our lifestyle, which we're going to get to today. <laughs> uh, before we get to those, can you talk about the prevalence, right? So we both have had skin cancer. Again, how prevalent is this? I assume more than we predict. Yes. Um, what most people may not realize is that skin cancer is the most prevalent skin cancer, as the most prevalent cancer in the United States, as well as other countries around the world. So one in five people will be diagnosed with skin cancer during their lifetime. Um, and so it is a very big deal. And it's not just, you know, um, it, it really is a public health issue. <laughs> it's not a personal health issue. It's a public health issue because most everyone will be impacted um, in some way or another by the sun, whether it's a bad sunburn um, and, you know, and the sun damage that accrues mm -hmm. aging. We know that the sun causes uh, accelerated aging and then there's skin cancer. So. so can you go over the A, B, C, D, E, and I think you add Fs <laughs> to, yeah. to the assessment of the skin, give the li listeners just a, a brief overview of what that, those letters stand for and what we can be looking for on our skin. Absolutely. This is like one of my favorite topics because I'm all about getting naked, right? <laughs> As a dermatologist, we have to see the skin. And even though I'm not um, actively uh, seeing patients in clinic, I still love to get people to party in their birthday suit once a month on the date of your birthday. That way you'll never forget it. You will be checking your skin every month, ideally before you head into the shower, you're already nude, just go for it. And so what you're looking for um, these A, B, C, D, E, F, A is for asymmetry. If you look at a spot and you cannot cut it down the middle and have it be the same on both sides, put a check mark next to it. B is for border. You want your spot to be uniform, um, nice, sharp, well demarcated borders, nothing blurred, blurred edges. C is for color. Um, most come in a lot of different colors. So they can be flesh color, they can be brown, um, we even have blue nevi, but what you want is uniformity in color. So if it starts to change color, has multiple colors, and there is something called an amelanotic melanoma, so that flesh colored spot um, is not, I don't want to put fear in people, but it's something to be mindful of if it behaves differently than your other ones. And and um, that moves us into D, which is diameter. So diameter is kind of a soft call. We always say less than five millimeters or the size of a pencil eraser, but you're looking for um, spots that uh, may be growing or, or bigger than your other spots. And then that shifts us into E, which is evolving, a spot that is changing over time. And that's why it's so, so critical that you are checking your skin every single month. And then F, is the funny looking spot, right? We call it the ugly duckling sign. It is the spot that stands out from your crowd. And that's why, again, it's so important to get familiar with what is on your ver your skin and know what your patterns are and looking for odd spot out. So for you, you had mentioned that you had basal cell carcinoma. The A, B, C, D, E, F really apply to moles and melanoma, which is a more deadly type of skin cancer. There's two types of skin cancer, melanoma skin cancer, non-melanoma skin cancer. The non-melanoma skin cancers include basal cell carcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma, as well as a few others. Um, and basal cell carcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma, they will appear um, oftentimes as a pearly pink little bump or a little pearly pink papule, uh, a sore that's not healing, um, especially with uh, precursors to skin cancer the actinic keratosis. It's like a scaly spot. You scrape it off. It keeps mm -hmm. coming back. So all of these, you know, the A, B, C, D, E, F, um, things that are scaling, doesn't necessarily mean you have skin cancer, but they're ones to take note of, take pictures of, and when in doubt, get it checked out. The easiest thing to do, especially now we have telederm and things like that, is to get an appointment with um, a board certified dermatologist to be able to evaluate you. Wonderful. Yep. You described my lesion very <laughs> accurately. I had something on my head here that was not healing, was kind of flaky, scabby, continued to grow. Uh, I should have seen a dermatologist much earlier, but I thought, oh, it'll heal. I'll put some cream on it. <laughs> it'll get better. And it didn't. And so I had to get biopsies 
while I was pregnant and find out that I had actually two. I had one on my back, which was uh, easily removed this on my head. I had to have Mohs surgery and then reconstructive mm. surgery. Um, but I've been burnt several times on my head. I mean, where does the sun hit me? <laughs> right there. So um, yes, I, I looking forward to chatting with you more because I now I'm realizing a how prevalent skin cancer is and that I'm more high risk, which I want to talk a little bit about. Um, but I, I'm thankful to to know colleagues like you who are going to help me with tips <laughs> for hopefully preventing <laughs> preventing future skin cancer. So back to something that I honestly don't remember from school is the Fitzpatrick scale. So really of our skin types, can you go over that a little bit with the audience? And um, so some individuals can identify if they're at higher risk <laughs> for skin cancers. Right. So I think the Fitzpatrick skin scale is a nice um, measure, but it's not absolute. And so basically sure. at one end of the scale is your most fair individual, blonde hair, blue eyes. At the other end of the scale, um, your darkly uh, pigmented individual, skin of color, um, dark eyes. And so if you're at one end of the scale, you're more likely to burn and increase risk of skin cancer. And at the other end, less likely to burn, but you're still at risk for skin cancer. Sure. And I just need to emphasize that. Okay. Um, especially, um, you know, Fitzpatrick's type, uh, like, five and four or five, we, we're seeing in the Hispanic population, you know, the, the people of, have more, that have more color in their skin, the numbers of skin cancer are rising. In the black population, we worry more about melanoma, acrylantigenous melanoma that occur um, palms and soles underneath the nails, spots where you're not necessarily thinking to look on a regular basis, or if something pops up on the nail, you're like, oh, I jammed my toe. Again, if something is not looking quite right, it's not resolving, get it checked out. So um, on that scale, even if you are at the, you know, less likely to burn, if you are on certain medications, if you have certain underlying medical conditions, that risk could, you know, bump you a little further to the higher risk side. So I think, you know, it's a, it's a nice reference point but everyone, everyone's I don't yeah. care what skin sure. color you have, you need to protect yourself. You mentioned nails. I have to ask, have you actually seen melanomas on nails? Mm -hmm. Do you think that getting the shellac, the nail, uh, obviously the, the nail polish that has to be cured with the UV light, does that really increase risk for melanoma of the nail? So I don't think that there's much you know, there's data to support that. The concern was the non-melanoma skin cancer with some of the uh, previous light sources that they were sure. using, um, but they've modified those lights. Uh, so I don't think the risk is nothing, um, but certainly would take a lot of exposure. Sure. But the important thing to your point about the shellac, shellac stays on the nails for weeks at a time. And then you know, women, they get their nails done, they get it soaked off, they get another layer of shellac just put right back on. Look at your fingers and toenails between the nanny and petty. Just take a quick look. You're looking for, you know, pigmented spots, um, anything that looks unusual. So take a quick look before you, you layer the, the, the new polish on. Wonderful. Let's talk a little bit about aging of the skin here. So what major things impact the aging of our skin? Okay, this is fun. So number one is sun. <laughs> and everyone thinks that dermatologists are like, we are sun, you know, haters. Not true. The sun is amazing. We just want you to get the benefit without the burn and the accelerated photo aging. Because uh, sun definitely it breaks down the supportive collagen and the elastin in your skin, um, which contributes to the fine lines, the wrinkles, the sagging, the discoloration. So sun is a big one. Um, Number two is your, is your diet. So diet is huge because uh, especially uh, the way we cook our food and added sugars, both of which contribute to the formation of accelerated glycation end products, which essentially are, you know, present that glom onto your collagen and your the support, same supportive tissues make them very um, uh, brittle and inelastic and they break. So contributing to, again to those wrinkles and fine lines. Um, in foods that are inflammatory. So inflammation, again, in the body, inflammation is the source of all bad stuff, but especially for your skin too. Um, it, 
lack of sleep. Sleep is a big one. Uh, when you don't get sleep, guess what happens, right? Your cortisol levels go up, your melatonin goes down, and melatonin is amazing for the skin. It's amazing for so many reasons, but it is one of the most potent antioxidants. So it helps repair some of the sun damage you got during the day. Mm. So if you're not getting good sleep and your melatonin levels are, are suffering, um, so will your, your skin repair. Plus, increased cortisol levels also uh, prevent repair of your skin as well as um, so it so it blocks formation of the collagen and interferes with um, repair of it so sleep is another another big one so sleep and stress I think can kind of go hand in hand I want to make sure I heard you right so you basically said cortisol impairs collagen production is that what you said yeah mm-hmm. so we don't want to get wrinkles we need to get our sleep <laughs> Live a reduced and we need stress. to yeah. yeah and reduce stress yeah. yes 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 um so what are your recommendations for, for stressing less? Yeah. Um, so prioritizing yourself, I think, is a big one, which is really hard, especially with what we're going through right now. And you have, feel like you have a million balls in the air. You're trying to maybe be, you know, mom and teacher and a career woman and, and um, partner, all the things. Um, and so I think that, little things that you can do throughout the day, even to um, help you feel, you know, with everything going on, it's easy to feel overwhelmed and unsafe. And so one of the things that I, I like to do is literally um, just put feet on the ground, like soles on the ground and, and you're grounded. And, and it's a quick reminder, like I'm here and I'm safe. Like I'm connected to the ground, I'm safe. Um, especially self-compassion, like soothing touch is a big one too. Cause you can do that anywhere while you're driving in your car or walking. Um, so, you know, hand on your heart, or I always find myself um, rubbing my legs or rubbing my arm. Those are little things uh, in breathing. So I think things that you can do anywhere multiple times throughout the day are, are, are some of the easiest things I'd like to share with people. Sure. Let's go back to oxidative stress for a moment. So when I think ox- of oxidative stress and the advanced glycation end products that you, that you were kind of mentioning, um, I think, okay, rust on a car per se, right? <laughs> like my cells are aging. So I want to protect my skin, my, my cells against that. So are there specific antioxidants that you recommend specifically to reduce aging of the skin, like for skin health? You mentioned melatonin yeah. as, as one, right? <laughs> so melatonin, um, vitamin C and vitamin E, uh, and they work synergistically together. You know, vitamin C is necessary for collagen formation and production. So that would be, um, we use it topically on the skin. A lot of, that's why you'll see a lot of skincare products have it. Same thing yeah. with resveratrol. Resveratrol is a great antioxidant. The bioavailability by mouth is not great. So you will see it in uh, a lot of topical products. Uh, green tea, green tea extract, a potent antioxidant. Um, the studies are actually quite uh, compelling in terms of skin cancer prevention, actually. Awesome. Um, so green tea extract, um, so drinking tea, and they're also using green tea extract in topical formulations. Another plug, uh, I'm a coffee drinker. So the studies um, for protecting the skin um, with coffee have really been compelling as well, especially mm. for skin cancer and melanoma. And, and it's not just the caffeination of the coffee. Caffeinated coffee, definitely the studies were done um, and that showed to have the most benefit, caffeinated over decaf, but it's actually also the roasting process. And in the roasting process of coffee, um, uh, basically niacinamide is generated. And so we know that this B vitamin is, is highly anti-inflammatory. And it's one of the reasons why it's being used, uh, niacinamide is being used in individuals who've had a history of skin cancer because it's supposed to help decrease their risk. So niacinamide, 500 milligrams BID, twice, sorry, <laughs> twice a day, yeah. um, has been shown to be helpful. So, so those are some of them. And then just, I think, just eating the rainbow. So I, I'm all for getting your antioxidants from food first. Um, and so uh, celery with luteolin and um, lycopene from tomatoes, 
you know, I focus on skin, skin cancer prevention, but, it, you know, they have so many benefits, but the literature is really impressive for ginger and um, celery, you know, the, the, the phytonutrients that are in those vegetables and fruits to help with skin cancer prevention. Wonderful. I will say here, if you're going to take niacin, you could experience some flushing, <laughs> just warning you, depending on... Ni not niacinamide. So it's a different formulation, so people don't experience um, the flushing with that. Cool. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, I, and I have seen, like you mentioned, a lot of these um, antioxidants or vitamin supplements infused in skincare, but obviously you're saying you can also take them orally for added benefit. Now, with the coffee drinking, <laughs> I would imagine you want to buy a mold-free, organic, like a high-quality coffee, especially if you're going to be drinking it long-term, right? <laughs> 100%. And that's what's so fun. I'm in a, um, I live in the Pacific Northwest, and so coffee is like the love language here, right? So there's so many small roasters, organic um, uh, coffee, so it's been actually quite fun to experiment in. But 100%. I think that that goes across the board for anything that you put into your body and on your body to find the highest quality that you can, biodynamically farmed, uh, organically sourced, especially things that you're putting on your skin because so much of it does get absorbed into your body. Absolutely. I have to ask, because you're a dermatologist, what you think about the retinols or retinoids? Like, how do you, are you for them, against them? What are your thoughts? So they're like the holy grail of dermatology <laughs> and anti-aging, um, which I don't love that term. As, as I'm getting older, I am not Benjamin Button. I am not aging reverse. I am getting older, so I'm embracing yes. the age that I'm at. But topical retinoids um, are wonderful, right? It's, it's a vitamin A derivative. And the, my chairman at University of Michigan he was doing a lot of the pioneering research. So I feel like it's been drilled into my head that, that topical retinoids um, are amazing. But for skin cell turnover, for anti-aging, we use it um, to help prime for um, uh, treating skin cancers and, and precursors to skin cancers. So the key is understanding how to use it and when to use it. Um, and it's different than the retinal palmitate that you'll, you'll see in sunscreens and things that have gotten a bad rap of increasing the risk of, of skin cancer. But, but topical retinoids like Retin-A used at night before you go to bed and, you know, you have to start low, go slow. You've got to then protect your skin the following day because it does make your skin more sun sensitive. Sure. Let's talk about sunscreen for a minute here. So I believe you do say that SPF isn't our BFF for sun protection and skin cancer prevention. So what's the alternative? Yeah, so I think <laughs> I think that sunscreen definitely needs to be part of your inner circle of friends, but it cannot be your, your only BFF. And the reason for that is the majority of people, studies have shown that the vast majority of people, dermatologists included, only apply about 25 to 50% of the recommended amount of sunscreen. So that SPF you're getting on the bottle is not accurate for what you're actually having on your skin. So you're going to need additional um, coverage to make sure that you're, you're fully protected. So what I like to do from the outside in, a wide brim hat, three inch brim, you know, sunglasses, protective clothing, um, and, and, your sun, uh, and your sunglasses, as well as seeking shade. Um, and then really you want to be setting yourself up with a good foundation fortifying, fortifying yourself from the inside out and that's where your diet your sleep um, your stress management comes into play what if someone wants to get a tan are you saying getting a tan is going to be bad and aging our skin or if we are well let, actually let's go back to first how should you appropriately apply the sunscreen let's clarify that first let's go back to that so for the average, um, you know, adult, a one ounce amount of sunscreen, the equivalent of a shot glass should be applied from the neck down. Um, and then you're going to need additional sunscreen, like half teaspoon for your, for your face. And you need to apply that um, before you go out and then reapply it every two hours. Most people aren't doing that. That's a so lot. Yeah, no. It's a lot. So if you think about the average um, bottle of sunscreen that you get at Target or something, it's four ounces. 
if you've got like I've got two teenage kids my husband and myself that's we should be done with that bottle yeah. that's yeah and I'll tell you that even me you know the dermatologist is like it's not always happening so I need to that's why I'm wearing the clothes and the hat and right. you know I'm doing other things to make sure that I'm protecting myself so I tell my patients and you can tell me if you disagree but I have been saying go get your vitamin d first then put on your sunscreen I've been saying get outside get 10 minutes of sun because you sunscreen will block vitamin d correct it will block the uv rays but what they found is not significant enough to really cause depressive levels the if the bigger issue is where we live sure. and what our lifestyle is like so even right now i'm so grateful it's sunny outside but where i live there's not enough you know, the, the difference between UVA and UVB rays, you need the UVB rays to generate your vitamin D, but UVB rays vary um, over the course of the day, season, latitude, longitude. So there's, depending on where you live, the, the intensity may not be enough to generate the amount of vitamin D that you as an individual need. So the vast majority of us are going to be deficient. Um, Agreed, yeah, I agree, yep. Yeah, so we're going to need to test and supplement um, yeah. And maybe we're not putting on enough sunscreen to actually block it anyways, because we're not putting it on appropriately, apparently. Yeah. And yeah. there are some studies looking at um, vitamin D filters for sunscreens as well, because, you know, it, it is a reasonable um, concern. Again, we want to get all the benefits without causing any harm. So it so, is something that's being looked into. Um, so what are the safe ingredients that we should look for in sunscreens? So I have always, even before the FDA came out with their concerns of the general recognized as safe and effective list and put like the oxybenzones and the octanoxate on the watch list, for me, it's always been zinc oxide and titanium dioxide and, and primarily um, zinc oxide. It blocks the UVA spectrum, the UVB spectrum. It's tolerated from your littles up until your adults for any individual with sensitive skin. So that's always been my vote. So I'll go back to my vanity question. What if we want to get a suntan? Or <laughs> should I not de be desiring that? <laughs> um, um, you can desire it all <laughs> you want. Um, and with a history of skin cancer, right. I would say getting a, getting, um, a tan is not ideal um, because there is no such thing as a safe tan. And it's all sun damage. Basically, your DNA has a little cap of melanin sitting over it. And when it gets hit by the sun, it's dispersing. That's what, you know, you notice you might get a little color right away. And then a few days later, there's a delayed tan response. Your, your, your body knows what it's trying to do to protect yourself and, it, and your DNA. Um, so spray it on. <laughs> if you want that glow, um, get it. But get it from a spray tan. Uh, that was going to be my next question. Well, what brand do you recommend that's safe? I feel like so many of the spray tans are just loaded with fragrances and parabens and toxic chemicals. So yeah, there, there are some, and to be honest, because I don't use them and I usually am like, love the skin you're in, go all natural. I, I haven't looked up some brands, but I know, um, like I usually just go to some of the, uh, green beauty bloggers or like mind body green sure. did. And I think not too long ago they did, um, a rundown and there are some organic um, products on the market so good to know good to know yeah let's transition to hormones here so how do hormones impact our skin health oh my goodness in so so many ways um, right and I think when we think about hormones a lot of times we just think about like estrogen and progesterone um, and estrogen is probably the, the, the best anti-aging, if you're going to use that um, expression, but it really keeps the skin um, buoyant and hydrated and youthful. Uh, but the other hormones that come into play are your thyroid hormone. And so many women are um, struggling with thyroid issues, particularly hypothyroid. And your thyroid can have a big impact on your skin, particularly making it very dry, um, somewhat doughy. Um, there are certain medical conditions where there's actually deposition of material um, into, I'm, I'm like rubbing my leg because that's usually where it shows up on the lower leg. Um, so so uh, thyroid issues can also cause hair loss, hair thinning. 
uh, one of the telltale signs, and it doesn't happen in everyone, is loss of the lateral third of the eyebrows. Yep. So, you know, our, our skin is so, it's, just, it's kind of cool because you actually make the, a lot of the hormones that are made, you know, from the brain top down and sending uh, signals all throughout your body, your skin actually makes many of those hormones as well, especially your stress hormones. Um, and melatonin, we can make melatonin in our skin. So as I mentioned, melatonin is one of the most potent antioxidants for repair, um, you know, and, and just not just for our skin, but for the rest of our body as well. So, so estrogen even helps with collagen production. So estrogen is not the devil. I think estrogen gets poo-pooed too commonly. And <laughs> yes, you don't want to be super estrogen dominant the majority of your life with poor estrogen metabolism and it's setting you up for increased risk for fibroids and cysts and breast cancers. But you need some estrogen for your bones, for your memory, <laughs> your brain, your heart, and even your skin. So I, I, I see women as they go through menopause and their skin dries up and they're getting wrinkles. They have dryness from their head to their toes. They have dryness everywhere. And estrogen can really help that. I also it find really th that many women who have polycystic ovarian syndrome have higher androgens. And with the higher androgens, they have that oilier skin. Sometimes they'll have the, the acne on the chin or in other areas of their body and a lot of hair thinning on the top of their head. And most of these women have low progesterone. <laughs> and I yeah. found that progesterone can be one, great for sleep and stress, <laughs> but it can also have some androgenic, some anti-androgenic properties to protect the patients against having the higher androgens. And, benef and it's beneficial to help balance out estrogens. When we're stressed, our progesterone is low. So usually reducing yeah. stress can help balance the hormones. And many women I've found, including myself, have benefited from taking progesterone to balance out the estrogens and the androgens, which can translate into better, healthier, balanced skin. I 100% agree. And I too have benefited from it. And had, and again, like when my health was just going down the tubes, had anyone really checked my hormones, they would have seen that my progesterone levels had been long, low for a long time, yeah. which is, you know, I'm, I'm a little type A anyway, like studying medical school and stuff, but like that anxiety and that angst jazzes up big time when you're low in progesterone. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so many women are just told like, it's just, you know, just in your head or you're just having a stressful situation and here's an antidepressant. You may need, I'm not saying that there isn't a role for medicine, but we need to look at women's hormones first mm -hmm. and really evaluate and understand the balance and how they are metabolizing them. And especially um, as women are heading into menopause, when there is low um, progesterone and there's estrogen dominance or there's, there's lower levels of the hormones and it's unmasking. It's not that women are so high in testosterone and their androgens. It's just, they're so low in the others. And it's, it's kind of like, who's going to take over and it can be life-changing if we could just get a, you know, a better idea of where they are and how to help them rebalance those hormones. Agreed. And it, starts with a simple test. Just getting your hormones tested appropriately can give you so much insight and uh, benef beneficial information that you need to improve your health. Absolutely. I, I want to go back and clarify a couple terms that I read in your bio, just so the listeners can hear for sure what this means. So I, I want to make sure that I, <laughs> I know what your skinny dipping method is. So is that is that what you opened with saying that once a month on your birthday, you're assessing yourself from head to toe? Is that what your skinny dipping method is? That is, you know, skinny dipping method is really this idea of helping women strip away all the thoughts, the habits, the, the issues that are holding them back from experiencing the vitality and the joy that they want and that they deserve. So it's really how I work with clients and it's very systematic of, of how we approach that. The checking your skin once a month, well, that's part of it because self-care, I consider checking your skin part of your self-care. But sure. no, skinny dipping method is more of, you know, how I, I, I just a playful way of, of, you know, helping women kind of get rid of all the stuff that's just holding them back from really experiencing the true joy that they deserve. Wonderful. So where did the Skin Whisperer, the title of your book, come from? Oh, great question. So as dermatologists, you know, we can look at skin and, you know, in a matter of seconds, know what stuff is. And I think people have said like, oh, you know, you're like a skin whisperer. But for me, 
Um, why I chose the title is because I wanted to share this idea that your skin is constantly sending you messages, as is your body, right? When things show up on your skin, your skin is a window to and reflection of what's happening in your body. And when things show up, they are clues. They are warning signs. And the goal is to see that, see these clues, heed these warning signs when they are just a whisper rather than a shout. Because in my case, my skin was shouting at me mm -hmm. and I was deaf to it. I was completely deaf to it. And unfortunately, I paid a price for it. And I don't want that for anybody else. Yeah, agreed. It costs a lot of money to have the surgeries that I had. And I, I'm happy to have that behind me and never want to have that again. So, that's right. It's not just the money, right? right? I mean, the money is one thing. That's like a hit. Like, you can right, feel right. It's, it's the loss of, I mean, you were pregnant at the time. Yeah. And I, I have a huge scar the anxiety, to, to show for right? it. Right. The anxiety and the fear. And is this going to happen? Mm -hmm. Like, what's going to happen? And, and, mm -hmm. and all of that, too. So, it's those intangible costs that actually are so mm -hmm. much more costly. And then what, the night before my, my reconstructive surgery, I had to go home with a big pressure dressing on my head to my baby, feed my baby. And I'm, he's looking at me like an, I'm an alien. You know, what's on mom's head? I, oh, that was terrible. Uh, but I'm thankful that we do have surgeons that could remove what needed to be removed. So I'm, I'm very thankful that we have, have medicine. Absolutely. So with the average woman spending nearly $300,000 on her appearance during her lifetime, what are your top tips for maximizing her return on her investment without breaking, breaking the bank? Speaking of finances. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's crazy. The beauty industry is a $500 billion industry and I have nothing against um, aesthetic procedures or a good skincare product. The issue is I think most women and, and it's societal pressure that we need to do these things in order to feel beautiful, in order to, you know, be considered worthy. And I am really a big fan of, you know, you do those things to enhance the way you already feel, you already feel amazing. Um, so there's a distinction there. So I really focus, that's why I focus so much on who they who who women are beneath the surface and really focusing on you know looking at nutrition and lifestyle and relationships um, and who they want to be in the skin of theirs I do a lot of work on mindfulness and I think that's another you know plug for hormone balancing as well you you look good when you feel good Right? Even if you're having a bad hair day, you radiate that glow from the inside out. And mm -hmm. if, you're, if your systems are not functioning the way they should be, you're going to feel like crap. So we really need to focus starting at the foundation. Love that. So that when you do spend that money, like you're, you're going to look amazing. I have nothing against Botox, but so many women spend thousands and thousands of dollars and they look good. And then you ask them, well, how are you feeling? And they don't feel good. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, what would your top longevity tip be if you had to pick one? And it's okay if you repeat what you've already said. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was just thinking, like, the first thing that comes to mind, there's a couple, but is, is good loving, right? Mm. And it goes hand in hand with good sleep because, you know, hopefully yeah. you get some good love and then you get a good night's sleep. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> and I think it's, that, you know, especially now where we've been so isolated, it's that connection and connectivity. And especially with touch, releasing that oxytocin, that feel-good hormone. Sure. So I think connection um, is one of my top. I love that. Do you know the song, Good Lovin'? Do you know that song? We did that for show choir. <laughs> it's a great song. You should look it up. <laughs> I'll look it up. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, I do know that you have a free gift for our audience. So do you want to talk about that briefly? Yeah. So um, it's, it's a glowing skin guide, right? So we've been talking about skin and how to get glowing skin. And especially for midlife women, I think when we talk, think about menopause, we're always thinking about hot flashes and headaches and weight gain and bloating and anxiety. But a lot of the things that are showing up on the skin that we touched on that you mentioned so, so beautifully is the skin changes. And um, we are always looking for like an antibiotic or um, other things. So this guide really helps you dive into some of the foundational things that you can do from within to you know get you on a good start but of course getting those hormones checked is going to be really really important 
I couldn't agree more. Well, we will post the link to that in the show notes for sure. <laughs> um, thank, thank you, Dr. Barr, for coming on the show today. You definitely radiate a beautiful glow. So thank you for that. <laughs> thank you for making it a difference in, uh, as a dermatologist, because you do have a different approach than many that I have seen for sure. And thank you for raising awareness, uh, especially, uh, I, I love the, the Skin Whisperer title of your book because i'm always going to remember i mean after listening that well hopefully the, the viewers will as well after listening to this podcast to really listen to when our bodies whispering to us not just with our skin but with any symptoms anything that's going awry that we should get that looked into we should we should listen to our body and, and really be in tune so i love that uh, so thank you for coming on the show today it's my pleasure it's fun <laughs>